stanza. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet, and Savior of the world. That there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you and God be glorified. If you have your Bibles, turn away with me to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, and we'll be reading from chapter 3, and we'll extract from Genesis chapter 3. If you wanted to read for your own leisure, you would read verses 1 through 24, but I believe that I will extract my text from verses 3 through 6. Again, the book of Genesis chapter 3, reading verses 3 through 6. And the word of God reads, and it says, but of the tree of, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And he, and he, and the serpent, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God does know that in that day ye eat thereof, then shall, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. She and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto a husband with her, and he did eat. And I'm going to use for a text this morning, Attachment Disorders. The making of a monster, but grace. Attachment disorders, the making of a monster, but grace. Can somebody say, I don't want to be a monster? Well, as we unpack this particular narrative, we'll trust God that you will discover that maybe you're not a monster, but... I firmly believe that there are some monsters in the church. So as we move forward, the scripture tells us that in the beginning, God, the Father, creator of the whole universe, who also created man in his own image, blew into man and man became a living soul. God gave man dominion over the earth and everything within the earth. God gave man one commandment, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The man and the woman decided to not to listen, decided, excuse me, to listen to the doctrine of Satan, which caused them to be detached. Can somebody say detached? Detached from God and they were kidnapped, molested, and toxified with the poison of sin, therefore causing man to have attachment disorders with God, thus producing the making of a monster, but grace. The making of a monster, but grace. Can the church say, but grace? You see, the question is, what is attachment disorders? Attachment disorders are the psychological results of negative experience with caregivers, usually since infancy, that disrupt 
the disruption, the exclusive and unique relationship between children and their primary caregivers, thus the parents. They may grow up with the symptomatics of hostility, irritability, instability from the relationship and thus never really learn how to form relationship nor to maintain them. You see, when a child grows up from the ages of infancy all the way through six, seven, eight, and nine and have not had a true attachment with the primary caregiver, be it parent, grandparent, the tendency is that they will grow up feeling unloved. They will grow up feeling like no one really cares. They, they go through life with attachment disorders. They do not know how to, com- to connect. They do not know how to reattach. So they find their lives drifting from place to place, and they're not really good at making or maintaining relationships. So when every time they meet someone, it's like they can have a relationship for a few years, and when they get bored with that, they go off and meet somebody else. These are people that have no boundary issues. These are people that really uh, move in the operation of not really understanding that, that they have to put the work in to build relationships. So if there's no relationship, uh, people with attachment disorders have a tendency to blame others for their mistakes. And they say they don't care and they really don't want to be in relationship with me anyway. So how does this work with our primary caregiver, which is God, our Father? How does this work with God concerning us, you and me? You see, when Adam and Eve decided to disobey God, they caused a detachment from God and was toxified with the poison of sin. In other words, when they made a decision to defile God, to rebel against God, they made a conscious decision to do the opposite that they know God did not want them to do. You heard me say before, rebellion is not rooted in ignorance. Rebellion is rooted in knowledge or, or shall I say, a knowing or a correct way or the right way. And rebellion is basically saying, I want to do it my way. It's kind of like Frank Sinatra singing a song, I did it my way, I want to do it my way. So when you find people that know the right thing to do but chooses to do the opposite, that's called rebellion. And the Bible says that rebellion is as a form of witchcraft. So Adam and Eve knew to do right, but they chose to do wrong. They knew that God told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they made a decision to do the opposite. I want you to understand here uh, uh, quickly and clearly is that you are only one choice away from, from going into some absolutely amazing, brilliant things, and are you are one choice away from throwing your life away. One decision. It's not two. It's not three. It's not four. It's not five. One bad decision can destroy your life forever. That's why we have to guard our minds and make sure that we are not moving in attachment disorders because of how bad our life was years ago. Will the church say amen? You see, Satan wants to destroy us by bringing us all kinds of pain and suffering in our lives. He figured that if we can, if he can get us to look at God as the boogeyman or the monster, or get us to look at God as the person that really, really doesn't care about us, our tendency is to blame all of the stuff that we go through on God. Now, you know, God is the master uh, caretaker of every human being on the earth. And since God takes care of us, We know that his superintendent was designed that none of us should perish. None of us should be lost. All of us should have a right to everlasting life. God's superintendent says that he wants all to be saved. Not some, but all to be saved. So when we understand 
that we are God's children and God is our father. We can't blame God for our own personal attachment disorders that we have with God when it was not our fault. It was with our with brother, brother Adam and sister Eve way on down the road. So we was born with attachment disorders. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you still are detached from God. And God got me here to tell you today is that you got to attach back to God by accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. You see, as a child, as a child, if, if you have received negative experience from your primary caregiver, now we, we're talking about in the natural how we have a lot of monsters in the church, but grace. You know, we, people that, that don't understand the reason why they can't love people is because they never have truly received the love that they needed as a child. And a child is from birth all the way up to six years old, seven years old, and even farther, depending on what that child has been through. So the first thing I want you to understand is that when a child goes through brutalization, the word brutalization means to be brutalized and over and over again by someone who says they love you. To be brutalized, that means whoop for nothing. That means uh, thrown in a corner for nothing, just brutalization. That means the person that's supposed to love you don't love you. Producing traumagenic factors and the lack of trust for people. Now, you all know that we have some people that that are in the house of God, that have accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, but they're still working through that infancy stage. They're still working through brutalization. They're still working through being mistreated by the mother or the father, or by the uncle or the, or the nephew or the niece. So they're, they're working through those traumagenic factors, and yet they come to church. And then the next one we have is horrification. That is to be horrified. Can you imagine a child uh, being horrified by his mother or by his father over and over again. I mean, many psychologists and psychoanalysts would tell you that there are some parents that would put a, put a Doberman pension or a um, pit bull in front of an infant, and that Doberman pension pit bull would be growling and barking, and that child would be horrified, horrified, going through horrification, hearing it over and over again. There are some sick parents that would take their kids and put them in closet. And as they put them in the closet, they put bugs and rats and roaches in the closet and close the door. And then they would turn the lights out on while the child is going through horrifying uh, experience. That's horrification. Now, you may not have done your children that way, but there are a lot of them out there. There, there are children that have been through all kinds of horrifying things, uh, been, been beat down through brutalization. And then the next one is abandonment. There are, uh, abandonment is, that is to be abandoned as a child while in the house with someone that you love. And, 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 and that's, the, that's the second phase of it. But the real definition of abandonment is someone to leave you and never come back. Now, there, I believe the worst kind of abandonment is to be in the house with someone that say they love you, but never spend time with you, never talk with you. Never take you for a walk. Never, never really get involved in your life. They just abandon. You are being abandoned in their presence. And, and we have many people that, that come to the church today, and not just this church, but all over the world. And they go into the churches with, um, they go into the church with uh, all kinds of things, such as brutalization. They've been brutalized by mother, father, sister, brother, aunts, uncles, cousin. Then they've been horrified by the world and horrified by relatives uh, telling them things over and over again, telling them how bad they are. They never amount to anything. And then we have those that have been abandoned. Abandoned, normally people that have been abandoned have problems with forming relationship. They have a trust issue with, with are you going to leave me? Are, are you, when are you going to leave me? I know it's coming. You know, you're going to leave me. So in, in other words, what they normally do is dick disconnect from people before the people disconnect from them. So those are abandonment issues. But the worst thing to be is to be abandoned while in the house with somebody that said they love you. You know, you're in the house, you see them every day, 
you know, but they don't spend time with you. They don't, they don't tell you how valuable you are. So those abandonment issues. Then the fourth of that is that repeated episodes of violence. This is to beat a child for no reason at all. No reason at all. You, you know, you just wake up and you want to whoop him. Or you wake up and you want to talk crazy to him and you're nothing. Look at your girl. You're just like your mama. Your mama was nothing and you're not going to be anything. You no good. Look at you. You act too much like your father. You act just like your daddy. Your daddy was nothing and you're nothing. I mean, just consistently with, with uh, episodes of violence, violence rehearsal, violence styles, violent words, toxic words, words that hurt, saying words with the intention to slaughter that child's soul, to slaughter their soul by saying things that you know will hurt them. And then the twisted part about that is that after they say those things that cause the child to feel all dead all on the inside, then they go with this thing called perverted love. They say, well, you know I didn't mean that, and I just said this, and I said that I didn't mean that. So the child grows up with kind of a, like a bipolar schizophrenic personality. He really don't know what love is. He or she just drift through life wondering when somebody really, really going to love me. So these are they that are in the church. You know, they, they're in the church. They grow up, but they don't grow out of what they're in. They grow up, but they don't grow out. Their mindset is still that toxic, uh, toxic residue with the hallucinogenic rehearsal. From time to time, they go back to what was said. They go back to what was done. They go back to how they was treated. These are they that make their way to the church. They come to the house of God, and many times we wonder why there's a disconnect with individuals that can't show love even though they're receiving love. Individuals that can't smile even though people were smiling at them. This is the creation of a monster. Is there a monster in the church? Are there monsters in the house of God? Now, let me give you more. It says when this, when this type of treatment takes place with a child, it may produce a monster, according to psychologists, those who have attachment disorders. Many will grow up without conscience, meaning that they'll grow up not knowing how to feel. They'll grow up not knowing what is right, not knowing what is wrong, because they've been through brutalization, horrification, abandonments, and repeated episodes of violence. So their conscience have been out of war. They don't have the ability to feel nor care about others. These are they that will see you on the street, shoot you in the head five times, walk away and go down to McDonald's and get a Big Mac and some fries. These are they that will cuss you out and literally wonder why you're saying what you're saying to me. These are they that have been, been trained emotionally not to care about people. Why? Because no one has truly cared about them. What do they have? They have attachments disorders. They, they really don't know how to love. The conscience have been seared. They've been beat down. But yet, these are they that still show up to the church. And one thing that is important is that according to, according to the making of this monster, there is one thing that they normally feel in how they express themselves. They normally walk in a sense of numbness and uh, the lack of expression. They are numb and they don't have expression. It's hard to get a smile on, out of their face. Why? Because their core says, nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Even their smile is contaminated with the, with the sickness of poison because they still don't believe that nobody cares about it. No one has really shown me love without leaving me after they show me love. They struggle with abandonment. They struggle with brutalization horrification. And years ago, you know how they used to say, and even to the day, oh, just get over it. Well, some people get over it differently than you. Some people take that bag of pain and they take it with them for the rest of their lives. You think they forgot about it because you see a smile. What they've done was just stored it in the repertoire of their mind. And every night from time to time when they feel discouraged, they, they go back, they rewind to the pain. And God does not want us to operate that way. We're not going to allow any more monsters in the church.
because in order to kill that monster, there's something that you just have to do. We're going to show you how to kill the monster. Do you want to know how to kill the monster? I can't hear you, church. Do you want to know how to kill the monster? Now, I'm not talking about the monster in somebody else. I'm talking about the monster in you. That monster that won't allow you to show love. That monster that find it hard to receive love. That monster that's always trying to question somebody. That monster that's always looking at what can I get rather than what can I give. That monster that just haven't learned that it's not about, not about them but it's about others. That monster. Do you want to kill the monster, church? I can't hear you. Say, I want to kill the monster. Hallelujah. Let's kill that monster together. You see, these are those who are on the streets of our cities. These are those that are walking the street. You know, little Ricky, little Flip, little Jack, Shanene, Shaquita, all of these walking the streets that been in and out of foster home that they really haven't had nobody to love them. And even if you're in a foster home, they can't love you like your real mama love you or like your real daddy love you. You can go through the, the emotion of it, but the love, so that become a hole in the child's soul. And they wonder, well, why my daddy don't love me? Why my mama don't love me? Why my mama leave me? And as a result, they develop those attachments. But God has a way of killing that monster so he don't grow up in you. And every time you're around people that love you, you can't even receive the love for the hole that's in your soul. You got to be able to close that hole and let God show you that God has your back and not only has your back, but he wants you to win. Will the church say amen? So they're on our street corners, and many of them are working in the office place. Some of them are on the market, and, and many of them have brought themselves into the church. And they come to the church with no conscience. They, 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 they don't know how to feel. You know, they, they're working through traumagenic factors. They're still trying to figure out, is this real? Or are they going to trick on me? Am I going to be deceived again? Am I going to be betrayed again? Do they really love me? Do they love me? These are those that are still wrestling with attachment disorders. But today, church, I want you to know that it is God that's going to make you free. You have to want to be free. You have to want to give people the benefit of the doubt. You have to want to say, no, it's not them, it's me. You have to make it up in your mind and say, I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to surrender myself to myself and to the power of God, and I'm going to stand up and be the man or the woman that I know God wants me to be. I'm declaring that I'm not a victim anymore. I am a victor, and I walk with the power of God, and all things are possible to them that believe in God. I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. You got to decide. That's what I said. You got to decide that you're going to take your life back. In the superintendent that God gave you, when he made you, he coded you with love. When he made you, he coded you with, with words. When he made you, he coded you with everything you need to be all that you need to be. So what God wants you to know this morning, he wants you to know that you can reattach. You see, Jesus came to reattach us back to our Father God who loves us. That was Jesus' assignment. He came to reattach us. And the reattachment is not based upon how I feel. The reattachment is not based upon do, I, do, do everything works perfectly for me. The moment you accept Yeshua, Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior, you are no longer detached, but you have now been made attached and re reattached to God your Father. God your Father is not mad at you. He's, he's not throwing a temper tantrum when you do what you do. He knows you intrinsically. He loves you individually. And the moment you get saved, you have been reattached to God. And now that you're reattached, there are some things that you got to work out. What I want you to know, church, is that you can, you can be attached but yet be distant with God because you believe that maybe God doesn't love you because of the thing that you've done. But God told me to tell you there's nothing you can do that can stop his love for you. Now know this, church, that the only treatment for attachment disorders, the only treatment for a person with attachment disorders is Love. You got to love people no matter how bad they treat you. So 
love. If you know somebody with attachment disorder, then maybe you have it. The only thing that's going to bring you through it is love. Isn't it good to love people that don't like you? Isn't it good to love people that won't help you? Isn't it good to love people that, that talk about you? Isn't it good to love people that, that, that you don't trust? I mean, it's love. Love, church, is the prime mover. The only thing that get rid of attachment disorders is love. Love, love, love. There are many hurting people in the world, and all they need is love. I know it was a song, but it's really true. All they need is love. They need, they need to know that you love them no matter how bad they treat you, how bad they talk about you. I share this brief story of my life personally working at a um, boys and girls town over in Missouri. And I think I shared it before, but I share it again. And that is that we had this young man that was coming from uh, some place in Missouri, one of the most notorious uh, bad places over there, and we got him in. And I got the call to say, hey, John, you got to be really careful about this young man. He loved to fight staff, and you need to watch out for those that are going to be dealing with him. He loved to fight staff, and he'll go off in a minute. And I said, okay, well, I'll send him on down. Send him on down. We'll trust God for the best. So he comes and come in the door, tearing things up, kicking holes in walls, and telling everybody, I ain't going to listen to nothing y'all going to tell me, and I don't want to hear nothing from no director and all of this stuff. And he just coming in, tearing stuff up. I'm talking about tearing stuff up. So he finally went into his room, and he did one of the things that, that uh, he should never do. He went in his room and started smoking in his room. Young man, 15 years old, roughly about maybe 6'5", weighing about 270 pounds, full of anger. And I ain't got time to be wrestling with him, and, and I wasn't going to wrestle with him. I said, I got to go for what I know. And he in there clowning, I mean, just acting the fool. So I went into his room, and he was sucking on a cigarette. I said, son, now you know we don't allow smoking in this room, especially, you know, you're not an adult. There's no sp smoking on ground. He looks to me and says, I don't give a blank, blank what you're saying. Now get the blank out of my office, I mean out of my room. I looked at him and said, okay, all right. Uh, I said, but you know the rules, right? And I stood there for a moment, and he said, didn't you hear what I said? Get the blank, blank out of my office. Now, naturally, the man in me wanted to choke him out, tap him out, knock him out. That was the man in me. But I had to make sure that I wasn't operating out of my emotion because somebody would have gotten hurt, be it me or him. There was going to be some pain up in that room. So the Holy Spirit told me to leave. I left out the room. I went into my office, and I sat down, and I always have some bananas and fruits right there in my office and stuff like that. I didn't respond to what he said. I went into my office and sat down, and he just tearing up the place, walking down there, cussing everybody out. And when he got through doing all of his stuff, he comes by my office, just right by the door. He, he walked down the hall by my office, and he saw a big old bush of bananas. He comes over, and he looks at me and said, uh, do you mind if I have one of those bananas and some candy? I said, sure, son, go ahead. You can take them. He looks at me and said, what? I can have some bananas and candy? I said, sure you can. He said, are you, are you, are you serious? I can have some bananas and, and uh, some candy. I said, yes, you can. And he said, uh, can I get two bananas? I said, sure, you can get two. If you want three, get three. I said, get some candy. And he paused, and a tear came out of his eyes. He said, I was expecting you to tell me, get the blank, blank on away from here because of what you did in this dorm and what you did in your room, but you didn't do that. You didn't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to tell you, that's how God operates. See, when we're at our worst, he still loves us. When we're doing crazy things, he still loves us. So when somebody's treating you bad, talking bad about you, you got to still love him. That's how you break attachment disorder. And that's what the church needs. The church needs to love people, even though they treat you bad. Love people when they talk about you. Love people when they lie on you. Love people when they threaten your life. You got to love. And when you love people, then God begin to move on their heart and begin to change those disorders and put them in order for his kingdom. If you believe that, somebody say amen. I could have easily retaliated, had him booted out, gave him a charge, and he'd been on his way to somebody's prison. But that ain't what God had for him. I told him, anything you want, son, just come in here and get it. And he used to come in and talk to me about his childhood, about how bad it was. He's a perfect example of children with attachment disorders. 
He wanted somebody to beat him up. He wanted somebody to talk bad about him. He wanted somebody to brutalize him, horrify him. He wanted somebody to abandon him, get out of my office and never come back in here again. He was waiting on the abandonment issue. He was waiting on a repeated episode of violence. Because all I had to do was make a phone call. They would have went in and did what they had to do with him. But he didn't get it. And since he didn't get it, his core begins to soften. He began to change. And he found himself coming to my office just to sit down. And we would talk from time to time. Church, in order to break the attachment disorders, it has to be love. Jesus said it best when he told us to love people. You got to love people. And that is the only thing that would overcome attachment disorders where a person can gain their conscience because now they're learning how to feel again. They're learning how to love again. So love becomes the prime mover for overcoming those that are hurting. We see each other, but we don't really know what each other go through. I don't know what your week was last week until you tell me. I don't know the nightmare that you had before until you tell me. I don't know what you're doing with your life. But I do know one thing, that when I see you, I need to move in love. Because even if you had a bad day, if, if I see you and show you love, the bad day may not be as bad anymore. Even if you had a bad month, maybe a bad childhood. Maybe if I give you the opposite of what you think I'm going to give you, maybe that would change your heart, change your life. We got to move and operate with love. So those that are struggling with attachment disorders, God knew it. He knew that my children are messed up. So he said, the only treatment that I can give to a person with attachment disorders, those that do not know me, those that have been deceived by Satan, and he got them out there brutalizing, horrifying them. He got them out there abandoning them and repeated episodes of violence. He said, the only way I can get to them, I can't look at where they're at. I have to look at where I'm taking them. I can't look at where they're in. I have to look at who they can be in. So the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 said, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, church, God set it all up because he know that we were born detached, but through his love, we can become reattached to our father. And therefore, we can go on and live a wholesome life. We can go on and be all that God needs for us to be. So God want me to tell you, but through his grace that you've made it to the other side. Yes, you may start it out with no conscience, but through his grace, you can regain your conscience. You may have started out with feeling like nobody cares about you, but through his grace, you can know that God loves you and that he will never leave you nor forsaken you. Even to the ends of the earth, you will know that God got your back. You will know that what the devil meant for bad, God would turn to good. You would know that God got you. He would never leave you nor forsaken you. Irregardless of what your mother did, what your father did, what your sister did, what your brother did, how people treat you, you would know of a surety that my God loves me. You got to understand that church is important. It's important for us to understand that. The scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. We don't have to try to get back at people. All we have to do is love people. <laughs> love people. That's all you have to do. And the more mature you get in the word of God, everything rewinds back to God. And God is love. Nothing else really matters until you know that your father is a father of love. Jesus said it this way. Jesus did not, excuse me, Jesus did this for us all. It, it, it's not that Jesus came and died for a few, but he died for all. All of us who had attachment disorders with God, we was messed up. Some of us still messed up. Some of us are still plowing through some things. We haven't got to the other side. We're still plowing through some things. We are still at the point where uh, we try to identify ourselves with what happened to me 
rather than what has happened in me. See, to me and in me is two different things. The moment I got saved, that's what happened in me. What happened to me is the natural. Will the church say amen? What happened to me or in me is the spiritual. So what happened to me is the natural. What happened in me is the spiritual. Now, if I live my life on what happened to me, then I will forfeit what happened in me. Will the church say amen? If I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, why do I always go back to what happened to me? I got to make it up in my mind that it's no longer what happened to me, but what has happened in me and through the power of God in me, accepting my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as my personal Savior. I know that I'm the head and not the tail. I know that I'm above and not beneath. I know that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Why? Because it's not what happened to me. It is what has happened in me and as long as I got him in me no devil formed against me shall prosper you got to understand stop being detached and start being attached to what is in you already you see it's the enemy that wants you to focus on your past if I focus if I went back and start focusing on my past I wouldn't be a Christian if I went back and focused on what was done to me as a child, I would have been, I would have been the left this stuff go a long time ago. See, so you thinking about your pain, but everybody got some pain. Everybody dealing with some. Can somebody say everybody dealing with some? If I was to rewind and go back to when I was four, five, six, seven, eight, and bring it all the way up, man, I wouldn't be in church. There's no way I'll be in church. If, if, if I go back to the churches that I used to go to and how much hell I caught in them churches from them people with them attachment disorder, trying to love when they can't love, trying to show you that they care about you when it's not in them. If I went back, I'd be on the corner running around robbing folks, selling drugs, doing all kind of stupid stuff. But let me tell you, church, it's not about what happened to you. It's about what has happened in you. When you understand that I'm a new man, that I'm not that guy anymore, that I'm not that woman anymore, that I am born again, and that I do live for Jesus. When you understand that it's not about what happened to you, but what about happened in you. And when you get that, then you can be all that God needs for you to be. Stop going back to that old person. Look to your neighbor and say, I got to kill that monster. See, the monster won't die. You got to kill him. As soon as something happens, you rewind back to the monster. You go back to the monster saying, hey, well, why are these things always happening to me? But what I love about God Help us, Holy Ghost. We serve a strategic God that knows about therapy long before it came into be. He said, I know they're messed up, but I'm going to draw them with my love. Have you ever got a blessing and you know you didn't deserve it? Uh-huh. It, it, it show was not about you. Have somebody ever opened the door for, up for you, and when you got surprised, you were surprised that somebody made a way for you? Because, see, church, get this now. God uses people to bless you. Ain't no angels coming down and, and open up a door for you. He uses people. And you have to learn quickly to love what God loves. And God is madly, madly in love. With people. He loves from the crack addict to the meth addict. From the lady swinging around the pole, he loves her. He loves the pimp, the player, the dope pusher. He, he, he loves them. He loves the pedophile to the rapist. He loves the armed robber and the burglar. He even loves the witches and the warlocks, those that are casting spells. We serve a God that... that that, that equally loves us all because he can't do nothing but love. And what the enemy would try to have you to do is to, is to linger in your pain and think that God doesn't love you. See, he's an equal opportunity lover. How he do for one, he'll do for another. The scripture says God is no respecter of person. 
That's why it's critical for us not to jack ourselves up like we're better than other folks. Because the same love that he has for you, he has for that warlock. He has for that homosexual, transsexual. You don't know what they've been through. You know, they, they have been detached. They have attachment disorders. And all you're doing is looking at the behavior, but you don't see the heart. We serve a, an awesome God. Oh, hallelujah. He loves, he, he loves you when you're not your best you. He know you messed up. He loves you when you're not you. He loves you. He loves you in spite of yourself. He loves you when you're at your worst. And that's where love really perfect itself. Stay with me, church. That's where love really perfect itself. The question would be, how can love perfect itself? Where love is perfected when you're at your worst and God says, I love you more. See, it, it, it becomes perfected because anybody can love somebody that's treating you right. Anybody can love somebody that's throwing a little stuff at you, taking care of you. I mean, that's, that's easy love. You know, that's, that's phileo love. And we have erotic love. But that agape love says that even when you don't treat me right with your attachment disorder self, I'm still, I'm going to reel you in out of your attachment disorders with one hook and one bait. And that bait is called love. You reel them in by, even when they treat you like a dog, you reel them in with love, love. Love, love, love. And the more you love, the more God loves you. So the question would be, why are you still loving me when you know I don't like you? Why are you still doing stuff for me when you know I can't stand you? You say, because the more I do it for you, the more love God gives to me to love you. We got to love. The only way to break this attachment disorder in the church is to love. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even that while I was yet detached from God, he still loved me. <laughs> Come on, church. I hope, you, hope you're hearing what God is saying. You have made it all about you when it's really all about someone else. The quickest way to blow somebody's mind is to love them. I try to make a habit, of doing, a habit of doing the opposite of what people do to me. Because you want a pure heart because there no prayers can get through without a pure heart. Now, you can make up stuff and make it look like you're being blessed, but if your heart is not pure, then even the stuff you get won't last long. He, he's looking at love. So when you pray and the root of your prayer is you got all this other stuff in there, God says, okay, I, I can't deal with that. Why? H how do we verify that? He said, if you have an art against your brother, do what? Go to your brother. Make that right and then come on and put up your offering. So you have to have love, move and operate in love. Can everybody say, I got some love? Here's a scripture that blew me away. You can read it and it's absolutely amazing. Romans 2 and 4, it says, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. I was smothered by that as I read it. And the more I read it, the more oxygen I, in, I inhaled. And the more I read it, the more liberating it was. So it's, it's not by legalism that caused people to obey. It's about goodness. It's about how good you treat them. See, when you're, when you're on the street and you treat somebody that you know is a criminal and you start giving them, hey, man, I got an extra $10, you want this here. He'll look at you and like, you mean I ain't got to rob you to get it? See? See, all people really need is to know that you care about them. When they know that you care about them, then they want to know more about you. Now, we hear that concerning teachers, but that is a truth that is concerning the whole nation, the whole world. See, when people know you love them, they want to know about you. And not only want to know about you, but want to know about who you know that's making you to be the way you are. But if, 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 if you're punitive and, and you are Moses, 
You know, you, 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 are, you are Moses. Moses is good to give out the Ten Commandments, but fact about it, Moses didn't want the Ten Commandments because he knew he was violating one while they was writing one. See, somebody said, well, they was down at the bottom writing the Ten Commandments. I mean, down at the bottom making a graven image. Here's what you didn't get. When Moses saw that, he got angry. And what did he do? He broke the tablets. So Moses was already broken while God was writing the Ten Commandments because he already knew if I see some coming down this hill ain't right, I'm going to snap on some folks. And he got down there seeing them worshiping his golden image, and he broke the Ten Commandments. So even while God was giving it and they was breaking it, even the leader had an issue where he couldn't control his anger. Can somebody say Moses is dead now? Oh, is he alive in you? That's the question. Is he alive in you? So, but, but God knowing, Romans 2 and 4 says, uh, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. Goodness of God, not treating people bad. Treat them good. And treat them good even if they don't want you to treat them good. Then you know what you're dealing with. If somebody treats you bad when you're trying to treat them good, you know you're dealing with the spirit of witchcraft, rebellion. They hold things. There are people that just hold things for no reason. I've been to many churches and many places, and I walk in, you know, I walk in like I walk in. I ain't trying to do nothing special. And I can look on people, side people's head and know they don't like me as soon as I show up. And these are Christians. These are ministers, pastors, bishops. As soon as you show up, they're like, oh. and, and they don't know why. And then when they talk to you, as, as long as you talk like a dummy or some ignorant fool, then they want to come over and help you. But if you talk with a surety, with your head up, knowing what you're talking about, you're not moved by their ontology, doxology, epistemology. You're not moved by their isms and their tisms. You know who you are and what you are. When you stand your ground and say, I know who I am, then they get offended. People like to deal with ignorant, stupid people rather than dealing with people that got themselves together. I'm not going to dumb down because you acting like a dummy. I'm not going to go crazy and do stupid stuff because you ain't doing what you need to do. I'm going to be who God made me to be. And if that means standing a surety with confidence so I can do what I need to do, that's what I'm going to do. But people with attachment disorders, have they, they, get, they, they feel good when you are down because it makes them look good. Monsters in the church, but grace. That's why this is a kingdom message. It's not a local message. This is for anybody you know that need to hear it. And, you know, you get the tape, get the CD, and pass it on. Look to your neighbor and say, pass it on. We got some jacked up folks in the church that don't know how to show love, won't show love. Even when they get in love, still don't know how to return it. And why? Because it's all about them. If it's all about you, it'll never be about me. If it was about God, he wouldn't have never sent his son. Will the church say amen? God said it ain't about me, it's about you. So we have to move past. Can somebody say I got to move past myself? See, so not knowing that the goodness of God leaded to repentance. I've seen some crazy folks in, in the correction system, and, and two years later, you look at you and even know it's the right guy. Why? Because they're being treated well. They're being loved. But grace and love is the only treatment for those who suffer with attachment disorders. That's it. Grace and love. And so if you're suffering from attachment disorder with man or with God, well, how do we do it with God? Is that you're mad at God because stuff didn't happen the way you wanted it to happen? Or let's say this, maybe you got saved, but you was never attached to God. Maybe you're an unbelieving believer because there are some things that Christians do that I shake my head on. I'm asking myself, are you really a Christian? I'm being, I'm, I'm being 100% uh, real with you right now. I, I look at something and I say, are you really a Christian? That ain't what believers do. do. Have you read your Bible? Don't tell me you're a Christian and you're still operating in your flesh. You're a Christian, but you haven't made it past the horrification, brutalization, abandonment, and violent episode. Somewhere along the line, you should have changed your mind. You can't remain the same when you say you got Jesus. 
But see, what happens is we, we have what I call counterfeit conversion. See, counterfeit conversion simply says that I confess with my mouth, but I don't have him in my heart. Because, see, if, if he ain't in you, sooner or later, everybody going to know he ain't in you. Will the church say amen? The scripture says, and ye shall know them by their fruit. Ain't nobody talking about no apples and oranges, church. We're not talking about bananas and, and stuff like that. We're talking about the fruit. So the moment you get the Holy Ghost, the fruits should come up out of you. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, including faith. You can't tell me you saved, sanctified, filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and have not produced any fruit. And the devil is a lie. Somebody ain't saved. You made a confession without the possession. And if you don't have the possession, meaning that if he ain't in you, which means the seed has not been planted, I don't expect to see fruit to come out of you when you haven't planted the seed of the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of the Spirit to bring forth love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Against such, there is no law. The question is, are you? You save or not? Are you are you saved or you just been tricking people all this time? <laughs> you see, there are a lot of people that know the right words to say, but haven't really haven't really gotten saved. They come up in front of the church and say, I, I, I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, but all that is is words. It becomes expensive rhetoric. Sounds good, but has no root. Are you with me? There's a man who was preaching for 30 years, and he said he never accepted Jesus as a personal Savior. So, see, you can train your mouth to say the right words at the right time, and then people are looking at the fruit. And they say, well, this thing is confusing because he say, say, but he ain't doing what saved people do. He say he loved the Lord, but if you really love the Lord, you got to love what he loved. Come on, church. If you believe that, say amen. You can't say I love God and hate people who you see every day and God that you've never seen. When you do that, you're telling God, you really don't love me like you say you do. Because when you love God, you got to love everything God loves. And the number one thing God loves, and that is what? People. I can't hear you, church. People. Come on, church. People. You got to love what God loves, and that is what? So grace and love is the only thing that breaks attachment disorders. The only way to kill the monster is with God's love and his grace. You see, grace helps us to love. <laughs> I love it when he gave me that revelation. I said, oh, thank you, Father. Grace helps us to love. See, I can have love, but if I don't have grace to love, I can go through my whole life mad at you because I don't have grace to love you. Grace helps us to love. It's kind of hard to love someone that's treating you bad. I know when my father, he was never in my life, never done anything for me, never bought me a pair of shoes, never bought me a pair of underwear, never did anything for my entire life. And I grew up with the, with the notion that as soon as I saw him, I wanted to murder him. And I told my mom that that's what my plans were. My mother got me and sat me down and said, son, you can't do that because uh, your daddy loved you. I said, well, how did he love me? And I, and I haven't seen him, but I haven't, haven't ever seen him. So at 16 years old, I made a decision to go visit him. And when I decided to go visit him, I went to him and and I, you know, and he's running around showing me everybody, look at my son. He's a football player. He's this. And I got, we got back to the house. I said, how dare you to run around parading me all around to your so-called friends? You know, I was 15 at the time. How dare you to do that to me? You've never done anything for me. You don't care nothing about me. 
And I just dumped on him, one after another, just dumped all on him. And um, my mother used to always say, well, son, you know, your father looked good in white shirts. That would be the main thing that she would tell me. He looks nice in white shirts. I said, wow, he looked nice in white shirts. You know, for 15 years old, what does that mean? He looks nice in white shirts. And she would tell me, she would say, son, uh, uh, you know, your father had it hard. I said, mama, but, you know, uh, how far does that live from here? You know, it, it, I couldn't even form my mouth to say dad. How, how, how far does he live? Oh, he's just about 10 minutes over there. So he was 10 minutes away, but a lifetime apart. So I grew up saying, well, forget this guy. I don't want to see him. I settled in my spirit that it's over with. As long as I got my mama and God has sent me some men around me to community fathers to help me to be the man that he wanted me to be, I was good. And as I grew older, uh, God began to do other things in my heart. I mean, you know, from, from being a star athlete, my father never seen me run track, qualify for the United States Olympics in 1980. He never seen me catch a football nor run a football, made it to the uh, – NFL, Dallas Cowboys, and USFL, Michigan Panthers. He was never there. My mother was never there. She came to a few meets earlier. So, so to, to go from that and then to have him to say, you know, uh, you know, I love you. How many of you know that when you love someone, love is an action word? Just like prayer is an action word. You, you're supposed to show your love, not talk your love. So as I got older... I'm wrestling around with this thing, and all of a sudden, uh, it hits me. It, it hits me hard. It hits me to the point that, that it, was, it was never about him. I found out later that my father was an alcoholic, so come to understand even more, God, God kept me from my father because he didn't want me to be an alcoholic. He kept me from him. I've never drank, never smoked, never been high, never sold drugs, did drugs. Don't even like being in the presence of people that do drugs, but that doesn't make me special. That just makes me a person that makes good choices, especially after you see the consequences of those choices. That doesn't mean I'm dynamic or special. It's just I decided if being drunk make you act like that, why drink? How many here we got to selling you? So I grew up in I grew up in life fighting attachment disorders, fighting this thing. And the older I got, I had to come to understand that it was never about me. My role was to be a good son. His role was to be a father. I wasn't a good son. Not until I got to my later years. My whole focus was on me. Come to find out, my father didn't have. An education. He signed his name with an X. He was a sharecropper down there in Jackson, down there in Mississippi. One generation from slavery. Maybe two. And the older that I got, I realized how many opportunities have I missed because of my selfishness. You see, it was never about my father. It was about me. You say, well, how could you say that, Pastor? Well, because God had already positioned me to be around people that love me. He's already put men in my life that told me how to be a man. He's already incubated me with a woman that, that knew how to love me passionately, a woman that took care of me. So he had men on the outside building me, a woman on the inside nourishing and incubating me. So all I was doing was crying about the man that God did not want to be in my life. Why? Because God was looking at today. I was looking at right then. What's the point? The point is that God will hide you from those that he don't want to be around you. Have you ever asked yourself the question that why don't I have a lot of friends? Hmm. Why, why don't I have a lot of friends? I'm a person that show himself friendly. And everybody that knows me knows that I'm the person that's very, very friendly type. I, that's my DNA. I love people. But God says people can misappropriate your love for them. And they can abuse your love for them. 
So God says, I have to gradually bring people to you that I know have your best interests at, at heart. So God trained me to not get upset. You know, the scripture says that, that he who has friends must show himself friendly. Well, what happens when you're showing yourself friendly all the time and you still have no friends? I'm here today to tell you, church, that God is guarding you. <laughs> there are some people that really don't even need to be in your zip code. Because they don't have your best interest at heart. They will get close to you to destroy you. They will get close to you to try to bring you down. Or they'll get close to you to try to make you feel like you're just like them. Look to your neighbor and say, and the devil is a lie. I'm not like you. So you have to make sure that don't be dismayed. Don't get confused when you find yourself out there on that island. Know that there's another eagle across the street. There's one behind you. There's one in front of you. Because sometimes eagles got to fly alone. An uh, eagle is a majestic bird, and God will have a camp meeting with eagles where everybody can come together and talk about their eagle story of how God kept you even when you was isolated. Can somebody say, I'm going to kill this monster? So grace and love is what killed the monster. You got to have, you got to have grace to do it. Go to Matthew 5 and 44. You can't do Matthew 5 and 44 without grace. And if you think you can, you just deceive yourself. And many times we think Matthew 5 and 4 is about people outside the church and not understanding that it's talking about the people, the monsters that are within the church. That's what I said, monsters in the church. Why? Because they're still suffering from attachment disorder. They want love but don't know how to give it. They're still dealing with what happened to them rather than what has already happened in them. So Romans 5 and 44, it simply says this. It says, but I say unto you, now this is Jesus talking, it's in red. Will the church say amen? But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You can't do that through your flesh and blood. You, it takes love to do that. It takes love. It's the grace of God. Anybody can love someone that's treating you right, take you out to dinner, tell you how great you are. But can you love that person that can't stand you? <laughs> can you love that person that wants to destroy you? <laughs> can you love that person that you know don't have your best interest at heart? I'm here today to tell you, church, that's where you know you don't have any more jacked up attachment disorder because you love them how God loves you. Come on, give God a hand praise for that. But the church struggled with that. The church struggled with that because we like to do, and we really want to do unto others as they've done unto us. But you must break through the pain of brutalization horrification, abandonment, and those repeated episodes of violence. And you must allow God to restore your heart through his love. God says this. He says, I know you've been through the kidnapping process, molestation. You've been toxified with the poison of sin, causing you to detach from me. God says, I know that. He says, but the moment you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you should be working on renewing your mind. God also tells you today, church, he says, but I sent my son, Jesus, who was also brutalized, horrified. He also felt abandoned, and he went through repeated episodes of violence at the cross in order to reattach you and I back to God. So the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have killed the monster. You have to tell yourself that I'm not a monster anymore. You have to tell yourself I know how to love God, I know how to love people, and I know how to love myself. 
You are no longer the monster that people want you to be. We got the church packed with them all over the world. But people don't feel like the love because of what happened to them. Remember, not what happened to you, but what has happened in you. You may have the residue of pain. You may walk around feeling like you're isolated, detached. And it's absolutely amazing at times that how you can, I know some of my colleagues, they go to these mega churches and hear me church. I have nothing against mega churches. I think that's a, a phenomenon of God. I applaud it. I appreciate it. But it's sad when you go to a larger church and you don't know anybody in there. You don't know nobody and, and you got to set an appointment to meet different people and, and you find yourself, if you have an attachment disorder, that can really throw you off because you're in a place where you shouldn't feel abandoned, but now you feel even more abandoned while trying to seek God. How many of you know that that simply means this? That simply means this, church. That simply means that believers have to become more relational with each other. It has nothing to do to the, with the pastor that got 30,000 people. I applaud that. I say praise God for that. But it's the people that are, that are messed up, the people that, that won't reach out to a brother, won't reach out to a sister, won't hold hands, won't, won't get into subgroups, won't get into these type of things. So the pastor, God brings them to him, but it's the people that won't reach out to each other. It's the people that won't show the love that they need to show to each other. Then men shall know that ye are my disciples by how you love one another. So the reason why they feel abandoned because some of them are waiting on the pastor to come down and shake their hand and say, hey, it's really nice to know you. But know this, church, Jesus never did that. The crowd loved each other and they got to know each other. Jesus didn't have time to talk to everybody that was in those crowds. He fed 5,000. But he didn't meet 5,000. So sometimes we want the pastor to do for us as what we can do for ourselves. So what do they do? They run to smaller churches so they can feel love. Because they don't feel the love in the larger churches. Because it has nothing to do with the pastor. It has more to do with the selfish people that are in the church that refuse to love each other. But God is telling you here today, church, that we don't have those disorders. We're no longer monsters anymore. We, we know how to love, and our conscience is wide awake, and we're coded to love. <laughs> You're coded to love, even though you won't do it. You're coded to love because God is love, and if God is in you, he's in me. He's in all of us, so you're coded to love. You feel your best when you know that you are love. You're coded for words, not words to tear you down, but words to build you up. You are no longer under the bondage of disorders. You have the passion of God to move people with your words. You need to tell people that I love you, I adore you, I think you're a great person. We need to move people with words. Why? Because we're coded to love. We're coded to be moved by the words that we receive. Ding dong, the monster is dead. The monster is dead. You can feel again. You can know the love of God again. You may be different, but you are not deficient. The moment you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, the monster is dead. You don't have to understand it totally, but I want you to get this phrase. The monster is dead. Church, but you have to bury him. The monster is dead, but you have to bury him. And you have to bury him through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you understand how important you are to the body of Christ, you won't linger around waiting on somebody to do for you. As for what you can do for yourself. You have to move past the pain of brutalization, horrification, 
abandonment, and repeated episodes of violence. You have to know that it's already on the cross. And since it's on the cross, all you have to do is start to renew your mind. Love, people. Love what God loves. Hear me, church. Love what God loves. When you love what God loves, then God will open up his windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to contain it. So if you want God to be what he needs to be for you, then you need to be what you can be for others because it's all about his love. Will the church say the monster is dead? It's not about what happened to me, but it's more about what happened in me. I am renewed. I am refreshed. I am moving forward. I'm letting go of my past. I'm pressing forward to the mark that God had laid for me. The monster is dead. The monster is dead. But I got to bury him. Stand to your feet and give God a hand praise in the house of God. Hallelujah. You the one got to bury him. He's dead. You can't give him life. 